I now have the pleasure of introducing Brian Hummel. Brian is a Texas native and a biologist by birth. That's interesting. Um, he has incorporated nature-based green infrastructure biomimicry practices into several habitat regeneration projects across private, state, and federal lands. Nature-based principles often improve the health of the ecosystem and convert flooding liabilities into agricultural abundance and groundwater assets. His focus is on teaming with nature to benefit people, planet, and profits. Please join me in welcoming Brian Hummel. So uh, thank you guys for having me today. Um, this is an incredible conference with an incredible group of people, and I am so honored to be here and share you with you some of my thoughts and ideas on beaver. I'm going to caveat that, that I grew up in Texas and I didn't even see a beaver until I was, you know, probably a teenager, and I saw one from the highway in Colorado. Uh, so everybody in this room knows more about beaver than I do, almost without question. However, I've learned about beaver processes from a very young age, so you're going to get my version of beaver, and it might not necessarily align with the real thing. But um, I also sort of split this presentation up a little bit because there was a gap yesterday and I was at 120 slides. So I was like, ooh, I'll fill that gap. So I already covered part of this presentation. So the people that were in here yesterday, you're going to get a little bit of a, a, a review. And then I'm going to break it down into how can we actually tap into billions of dollars of funding to help us do the projects that we all want to do to try to make a better world for our kids and protect our water supplies. So I'm going to go through the first slides really quickly. Um, luckily, I believe this is being recorded, so you can go back and watch it later. Uh, obviously, it rains in the east and it rains in the west, but it rains a little bit more in the east than it does in the west, so it's typically wetter, and we have different problems in different parts of the country. Um, one of those problems is if you get a hurricane, like Hurricane Ida almost a year ago, hit uh, down in Louisiana, brought some serious flooding, but man, it brought flooding across the entire United States, up the east coast, almost to Canada, and we were being left with too much water. And this is gonna happen over and over again. This is a hurricane track from like 1949. And it shows you that it's not a matter of if we're gonna hit by these storms, it's only a matter of when they're going to come. And how can we manage this amazing water resource when we get 45 inches of rain in two days? Um, at the other times, at the other extreme, we have places in the country that hadn't, haven't had nearly enough rain. We have significant drought. But I would like to highlight that drought and flooding are really two sides of the same coin, and we can manage both with processes that you guys know more about than I do. Um, I'd also like to highlight that these natural disasters, whether it's too much rain, not enough rain, the big storms that come in, uh, m m these natural disasters are incredibly expensive for our country and our people and people are looking at ways that we can mitigate these types of disasters, whether it's wildfire or drought or flood. The cost of these natural disasters is going up. I want you to take a look at, I need to, I don't even have the laser pointer anymore. I want you to look at 1987 down here. There must be a fluke in the data because this is the first time on this map that we've spent less than $27 billion on natural disasters. So please focus on that $27 billion figure and look at this chart. Every year, we're more than $27 billion in natural disasters. In some cases, we're almost to $500 billion in one year. Excellent. The reason I bring up $27 billion is I'm not trying to, it's a, it's a touchy subject, but apparently the financial cost of 9-11, not the human cost, but the financial cost of 9-11 was about $27 billion. That last chart shows us that we're having more financial damage virtually every single year since at least 1987, more financial damage than 9-11. Yet our messaging is not right because we sort of ignore the fact that we're spending $500 billion a year in climate disasters. And I'll leave it at that. I think that there's there's a way that we, we can bring people to the table as as much as we did after 9-11 if we start understanding that the ecosystem losses and the natural disaster losses that we face every year are, are equivalent in terms of value and greater in terms of value. So how do we solve these problems? We can do it by looking at the water cycle 
bringing our hydrologic cycle back together, we can solve drought and wildfire and fl flooding and groundwater declines and harmful algae blooms and sedimentation of our rivers and uh, hypoxia in the Gulf and subsidence and saltwater intrusion and all these multi-billion dollar problems. And we can do it by changing the way that we manage our land and how that we let nature manage our land. So I think everybody understands that when the water runs off, right, when a water drop comes out of the sky at 27,154 gallons per acre inch, that water can only go three places. And I asked the people yesterday, where can, those, where can that water drop go once it falls out of the sky and hits the land? There's three places it can go. So audience participation, point, where can it go? It can go up. I see up. It can evaporate away. Where else can it go? It can go down. It can infiltrate into the ground. Where else can it go? And it, yeah, runs off. Only three choices. And how the land is managed determines that. So if we let the water run off, it hits our river. Sometimes it hits our rivers too fast. What happens if it goes in? Most people don't understand this quite as well because we don't see every day the groundwater system, the aquifers. So if we can help this water slow spread, sink, soak, and store in the ground, eventually it's going to make it to our groundwater supply. And there it's, it's basically much more protected than being in muddy floodwaters. The way we manage our land is, is really critical in that. So a lot of people have also seen this diagram. It basically shows that the more we develop our land, the faster it runs off. But I'd like to say that that's just in the urban setting, and really we don't have all that much urban land. So if you look any of my titles where there's air quotes or there's quotes around the title, if you search for here's how America uses its land, you'll come up with it, or any of the titles. If they're in quotes, you search for that feature, It'll be the first thing that comes up on your search engine, most likely. So look at, here's how America uses its land. The Bloomberg went and they uh, basically divided the United States up into little squares. Each square represents about 250,000 acres. And they then combined what land uses they have. So everybody knows, yeah, we've got, so we have more forestry in the east where we get more rain. We've got all this brown cropland. And in the I states, and then we've got a lot of grazing land and a little bit more in the uh, uh, forestry in the, um, in the west. You can see cities like San Antonio and Austin and Houston and Atlanta and all the east coast and L.A. So you can see where the major urban areas are. So everybody understands this map, right? Yes. But now let's jam all the light parts together. So you can also see that urban only covers just a small portion of our land, you know, maybe 4%. If you include this miscellaneous and the suburban, you know, maybe 8% of our land mass is actually under an urban land use. 35% under grazing, 28% under forestry, 20% under crops. So if we want to solve watershed problems, where do you think we should focus? I think we should focus here. And now let me also highlight to green an acre of land in a place like Philadelphia or New York or any major city, to green an acre of land to soak up one extra inch of water in an urban setting often costs two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars per acre. I can do it on farmland for twenty bucks, and I can give that farmer a rate of return of like one hundred and seventy-six percent annual rate of return. So my questions are: when we look at these large-scale ecosystems and we want to try to mitigate these natural disasters and do it without going into, you know, debt to do these things. Um, how did nature manage these lands? How did teaming with nature benefit us today? How can we mitigate risks in each land use? And how can we tap into current funding opportunities to help us meet these goals? So bison manage the uplands. I'm going to basically leave it at that. Beaver manage the lowlands. And I think you guys understand that better than I do. And there's different ways that we can, we can treat our land. Bad land management often leads to soil erosion and desertification. So we cut down all of our trees. We rip up all of our soil. The soil washes off and gets into our creeks. We basically dehydrate our uplands and we flood out our lowlands. We make a very flashy system that carries all of our precious soil and water down into our local waterways where it leaves the land where it's a national asset to like grow food and give us all these great ecosystem services. And when it ends up in our lakes and streams and rivers, it becomes a national liability that we all collectively pay millions and millions of dollars to try to fix and resolve. However, you can do ecosystem restoration. You can, work, you can push that ecosystem back to health. And one of, the, one of the ways they're doing that, you can see they're slowing the water down. This is like the way the beaver makes those little channels out from the beaver dam. They're spreading the water out. They're giving it a chance to soak in 
and rehydrate the landscape. And by doing that and replanting and bringing back the biodiversity and having intact ecosystems to include things like the bison and the wolf and the beaver, um, oftentimes you can basically bring entire ecosystems back to health. One of the ways you can do that is um, through funding from federal agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So the USDA funded this particular project with a Young Farmers Grant. Right now, if you're a young farmer or you know young farmers, they fall into the historically underserved population of farmers, and about 40% of all the USDA, USDA funds over the next several years are supposed to go to historically underserved populations. Young farmers qualify. So this gentleman, well, this family really, took a very degraded piece of property. They added these contour uh, bars that are basically mimicking beaver on contour, slowing the water down. I do want to also highlight his little chickens. So he, did, he does rotational chickens, moving them around, and that's basically mimicking the bison. They never stay in one spot too long. They are, they're always moving. Um, again, on contour, you can see that they don't really have soil. It's like a, almost a white rock, a white, white caliche rock. Um, there's his chicken houses, but within one year, he has life and vibrancy and gravity irrigated fruit trees. There's his chicken houses again. So let me ask you guys, what are the four things that plants need to survive and thrive? Water, sunlight, soil, what else? Who said that? Say it louder. CO2, okay. So what's plentiful everywhere on the planet? Sunlight comes up every morning. If the sun stops coming up, I promise you have, we have much bigger problems on our hands. What else is plentiful everywhere on the planet? CO2, it's at the highest levels in our atmosphere than there have been for a really long time. So in the chemical reaction of life, those two things are not limiting. They're not the limiting reagent for the chemical reaction of life. The two things that really unlock a, a, a property's potential are the quality of your soil and the quantity and timing of your water. So the longer you keep soil and water on your property, the healthier it's going to be. And so that's how you can turn rock into fruit trees by adding water. Here's another Young Farmers Grant. I want to highlight that, yes, we're using the Tonka truck. So if Joe, Joe Wheaton was here, I, I would tell him that, yes, I like to play on the big Tonka trucks too. So he always talks about these Tonka truck projects working on postage stamp size projects. And that's sort of what we're doing, but this has the opportunity to be scaled. Um, I also want to highlight right here, the low spot is where the water is actually being stored. So even though it looks like we're making a dam, water never gets backed up against that dam. You can actually see these spillways. So that's a break in the quote dam, but it's at existing grade, spillway, at existing grade, spillway, 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 all at existing grade. And then the, the, those, those spillway structures are offset. So one flows into standing water, and the water has to go over here to flow over into standing water or flow over here and flow into standing water. You never want to see all the spillways lined up in a straight line. So no spill, you know, spillway, you don't want to have a spillway here or here all lined up because sort of like the bricks in a house, you want them to be overlapping. It's the strength. If you, if you have a house and there's vertical seams, don't buy it. Your mason didn't know what they were doing. So you always want to have overlap, and you want that water to be zigging and zagging through the whole property. Uh, this is basically another example. This is like, the, I'm calling this beaver biomimicry, and yesterday you heard me talk way more about beaver biomimicry and doing it with sticks and brush and stuff, but I'm going to skip all of that. Um, but it recovers fairly fast. First big rain after these were dug, and a year later, you know, well vegetated, and uh, uh, with the grass roots, growing deep, it makes these things infiltrate that water really quickly. So we're turning flooding liabilities into biologically filtered groundwater assets, and we're creating local agricultural abundance. We're gravity irrigating all these fruit trees. So in this concept, we can use the brilliance of the beaver, but we can actually plant trees instead of, you know, chewing them down. Although I think that beaver overall probably bring in more trees than they take out. And these are winning awards. So this gets back to something that I've heard, a, a continuing theme. Scott talked about it earlier. They were talking about uh, someone this morning said, what's your permitting process? They said it takes a couple of years to get one of these projects permitted. So now we can do work like this to slow water down on the uplands with virtually zero regulation, especially if we compare it to how many rules and regulations and red tape and hurdles you have to do if you want to do it in a riparian zone or a waterway or a 
a floodplain or, or a wetland. Um, and this particular project was at the city of Austin. It's winning the EPA Green Infrastructure Award, as well as actually the, the first uh, project with the chickens won an EPA Green Infrastructure Award. The city of Austin funded this with their tree mitigation dollars, and they're doing it to basically restore habitat. So they're bringing back pollinator habitat. They're enhancing endangered species habitat, and they're slowing, spreading, sinking, soaking, and storing water in the landscape to protect vital springs like the uh, Barton Springs, which what the mayor calls the crown jewel of Austin. They're doing this with the support of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with the, the basically praise from FEMA and the Corps of Engineers, winning awards from the EPA, getting all sorts of kudos from all the same environmental organizations that might fight you when you're doing work on lowlands. So if we're talking about permitting, if you get out of the if you get out of where the beaver normally are in those wetlands and the low-lying areas and the watersheds, and you do the same beaver biomimicry and put their brilliance all the way to the top of the hill, you can avoid a lot of those regulations and things that might slow a project down. So I, I sort of hate to go after uh, Sarah and Jacob because they had such a great streamlined presentation and she said, don't beat people over the head with information, but I am sorry, I'm about to do exactly that. So, so let me, let me, I'm going to get two slides and then I'm going to start really jumping into how we can access funding. So this again, showing what happens when you slow, spread, sink, and soak that water into the ground. You can actually see these things from space. So we're doing beaver biomimicry, we're planting trees, agroforestry on perfect contour, we're putting in some of these swales on perfect contour. When it rains, you catch that water and instead of it all rushing off, it stays, it soaks into the ground. These are what they call swale plumes. So if you look swale plume up, look for a 98 second video, watch that 98 second video. It's incredible. It'll change your life. It's a little animation with the uh, Australian guy and it's great. Um, you can do contour agroforestry, again, planting trees on contour, trying to slow spread, sink, soak, and store that water in the landscape. You can do contour orchard. This is actually in a key line pattern. So instead of being perfectly on contour, these are not, but they make perfectly straight rows. So you can still get in there and do mechanical. Uh, you can still run your tractors and ha be efficient at harvest. Again, straight rows allow for mechanical harvest. But this is nothing new. Native Americans and, and indigenous people around the world have been doing this for at least 6,500 years. Uh, this particular spot in Ohio is Fort Ancient, Ohio. It's 2,000 years old, 131 ponds. They created three and a half miles of contour beaver biomimicry bioswales. And these things are turning flooding liabilities into groundwater assets and basically gravity irrigating a bunch of trees and fruit trees and food for uh, local people. The other thing I think is important is these systems are still functioning today after 1,800 years of total neglect. And people complain all the time about green infrastructure practices because when you plant them, they require so much maintenance. I really think that if you're having to spend a ton of money on maintenance, you've created a liability and you designed it wrong in the first place. You know, there's examples that these things are lasting using biomimicry and mimicking nature. They, they can last for hundreds and hundreds of years with zero human help if you do it right in the first place. And it's happening around the world. So following these same, basically, beaver biomimicry practices, similar to, like, the rice paddies across Asia, uh, this is a group where uh, the Chinese government sort of voluntold people they were going to restore the Yellow River, and they turned a desert, a degrading desert ecosystem. They reversed that downward trend, and they created an upward trend. They created a positive feedback loop where now they have a healthy forest, a healthy agricultural ecosystem across millions and millions of acres, sequestering megatons of carbon and bringing millions of people out of poverty, and they're doing it by teeming with nature. So how can we do that here? The USDA spends billions of dollars every single year on projects to help farmers. And if you look, they are slowing, they're spreading, they're sinking, they're soaking, they're storing water into the landscape. They're keeping the two, they're helping farmers keep the two most important assets on their farm. And by doing so, they're helping bring the peak of the hydrograph down. They're helping our creeks become more stable and better able to support things like beaver. There's all sorts of different projects that they provide cost share on, whether it's cover crops or riparian buffers that we talk so much about or filter strips, contour farming, and so forth. Uh, they'll even help you put up beaver dam, uh, beaver dam analog. So this is from Joe Wheaton's website. Um, 
He has all sorts of NRCS specific resources. This is where they've already gotten uh, uh, approval for uh, uh, doing these types of practices, and they're getting support from the USDA. Uh, every state, every state's been awarding these conservation innovation grants, but they're relatively small amounts of money. I think it's about twenty-five to fifty million dollars a year. Uh, this just this year in February, they released a new program Kai, called Climate Smart Agriculture to basically take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in the ground. Uh, I know y you guys know that beaver can do that, but it's a billion dollars a year. And I really love these RCPP projects, so I'm really going to drill down into these. About $300 million annually. M many are focused on regeneration projects. You can see there's maps across the entire country. I don't know why, but I know almost every single one of these. I could almost do it verbatim. And more than half of them are just mind-blowing to me. These projects are exceptional. Let's look in Arizona. They got $2.7 million to basically put a bunch of juniper dams down on contour. They're doing beaver biomimicry using a wildfire liability when they do wildfire clearing. They're laying it out on contour to slow spread, sink, soak, and store that water in the landscape, and they're turning it, into, turning it into groundwater and enhanced drinking water supply. Funding, USDA. This is uh, $7.5 million, working with the Milwaukee River w Watershed Group, similar to what Bob was talking about the other day. They're putting money out there to buy up. Whoops, whoops. They're putting money up there to buy up land in these areas to preserve the agricultural economy. And I bet with the work that they're doing now documenting where there can be beaver habitat, you can focus some of these funds on the area to preserve the spot that's about to be a beaver wetland if we just stop killing beaver. Uh, in Maine, there's a project, again, $8 million to protect 10,000 acres of forest to preserve drinking water for one-sixth of Maine's population. And, I mean, incredible stuff here. There's a project, uh, Restore the Earth, in uh, um, Arkansas. They got $7.5 million for helping landowners who want to put wetland conservation easements on their land to leave room for the river to grow trees down there in the ri riparian habitat instead of trying to grow corn in a wetland. And, ooh, I'm going to go back. I want, to, I want you to pay particular attention to this sentence right here. Project partners have committed to purchasing carbon credits associated with project activities. They're tapping into Fortune 500 companies are pledging to sequester carbon. Here's another one. Protecting 27 miles of river upstream from Jackson, Mississippi to protect the drinking water supply. But they're also enhancing habitat for migratory birds and turtle species, threatened and endangered, contributions provided by the carbon fund. So we're protecting drinking water supply for the entire community, investing in assets instead of investing in something like another water treatment plant, which many people might not like me to say this, but a lot of those water treatment plants turn into liabilities. And I say that because they cost money year after year after year after year to maintain, and many of them are falling into states of disrepair to the point that it's not even worth fixing what we have. We're having to build new ones. So why not clean the water before it ever makes it to our city? And now we get multiple stacked functions like outdoor recreation opportunities, habitat protection, carbon sequestration. In Florida, they're trying to protect the springs that bring or ma major economic engines. I bet you guys know things that would help protect spring flow by increasing groundwater recharge. $7.1 million. Here's preserving upriver farms to reduce flooding in North Carolina. $8.5 million. Hmm. They're trying to prioritize parcels to lessen flooding and stormwater runoff. Hmm, what else can help us with that? $3.5 million working on Native American land to improve stream habitat. What else can improve stream habitat and restore streams? Um, Audubon Conservation Ranching. I think this one's phenomenal. Just look at the, okay, so that we got $3.25 million from the federal government and they're going to protect about 2.3 million acres of land through bison biomimicry, bring the birds back. The bird decline is sort of like the canary in the coal mine. We need to be paying attention when, the bird, when our bird rates are doing this and our insect rates are doing that and everything's going down. That's a sign. So we can use this dollars for just a few dollars per acre to restore entire watersheds, make that land a better sponge. Again, 1.8 billion dollars in 2021 dollars through this equip funding but that's not all housing and urban development has now really gotten on the bandwagon for nature-based solutions in quotes nature-based solutions hud will pay for nature-based solutions 
and they've spent $89 billion since 1992. Uh, the EDA, Economic Development Administration, is trying to protect the economic engines for these communities, and water is one of those. Uh, they have this Build Back Better regional challenge. The gentleman that was the Biff, Biff talking about, hey, those beaver came back and they're building it back better. If we can demonstrate that beaver are an economic asset to these communities, we can tap into additional funds for the Economic Development Administration. We can protect our communities from these threats. Same thing. Uh, NOAA, I know Chris is going to be speaking up here in a minute from NOAA. They have several different projects that are conserving habitat and decreasing floodwaters. They've got an amazing U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. You can go on there and you can learn about different federal programs that are helping communities become more resilient using nature-based techniques. Um, they are also doing different uh, uh, projects across the entire country. Here's some more they're working on using nature-based solutions to improve fisheries habitat. What else improves fisheries habitat? Uh, Engineering with Nature, the Corps of Engineers has this new program called Engineering with Nature run by a gentleman named Dr. Todd Bridges out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. They literally trademark the term. Our government says, hey, this is such a good idea. We're going to trademark these three words, engineering with nature. So now we can't talk about engineering with nature unless we put a little TM after that. But, but it's a step in the right direction. You know, and, and they have funding to do things like what we're doing here in this room. Uh, look for beaver on grants.gov. You come up with one match. Okay, not so great. Uh, but look for flooding, 66, uh, 66 aspects of flooding. Look up drought. You've got 61 matches for drought. Look up, uh, what am I looking up here? Nature-based. Well, 15 different hits if you search for nature-based, but 100, 1,100 if you search for nature and base. Let's look up climate resilience. 365 returns if you search for climate, 299 returns if you search for resilience, but 479 if you search for climate resilience. So, Grants.gov can help you tap into things that are going to invest in water for a better tomorrow. And I'm almost done. I want to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi. Who, who here likes Star Wars? Do you think Obi-Wan Kenobi is important and why? Okay, so when the NRCS chief, if you have Obama and Tom Vilsack, the guy that runs the NRCS underneath Tom Vilsack under the Obama administration, calls this dude Obi-Wan Kenobi, the EPA is getting $50 billion of extra money to clean water supply. One of the things that we can fund is actually that machine right there that plants cover crops. These cover crop projects are getting support from FEMA and the Corps of Engineers at the same time, protecting water supplies, protecting things from flooding by keeping the water on the land. I highly recommend just Google Obi-Wan Kenobi and soil health and read up on this guy. There's several reasons why we can talk about later. And then it talks about here, we're getting an extra $50 billion for the SRF funding, Clean Water State Revolving Funds, and these are very flexible funds if you get the right language. And I was hoping I would have more time to talk about language, but I'm getting the evil eye to stop. And General Mills, oh, by the way, General Mills put $500,000 towards that project in Kansas that's using those cover crop uh, machines behind Dave Brandt. So private sector is getting involved. Shell is pledging to protect 120, well, they're protecting to sequester 120 million tons na annually through nature-based solutions. Uh, regenerative energy, I highly recommend looking at this site too. They're making, they're making solar projects that they graze underneath them so we can have food farms and solar farms at the same time. We don't have to decide between energy or food. We can have both. Uh, this is another thing talking about that. And that's it. So thank you so much. I apologize. I went a little bit over. I hope there's still time for questions. Oh, talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to chat about this. I dream about it at night. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me.